Hi, everybody, and welcome to our next session of Soiree 2024. And in uh, keeping with the spirit of moving things along really quickly, both of our uh, presenters to, for this session have provided us with uh, fast forward videos, and I have those queued up. So I'm going to work on sharing my screen here, and hopefully I'm, I think there should be a mode here where I can actually, nope, it doesn't look like I can select a specific area of screen, but I think I can push this button and show. Enjoy our two submissions. Hi, my name is Richard Thompson, coordinator of digital design at NGIT. I love introducing students to animation. However, they often misjudge the complexities and the results can be a lot of purposeless movement and a story that lacks clarity. So I thought I would share with you my most current methods. So in this project, the challenge is to create a machine that interacts with a trash can. Simple enough. The machine must first complete its function moving only as a machine. At a chosen point and with cause, the machine must come alive. The camera has to be locked off, making us plan our staging. And the machine cannot be humanoid in any way. No head, no blinking eyes, no legs. Movement, and only movement, can make the machine come alive. We watched a clip from the circus, all spotting the exact moment Chaplin comes alive. So what exactly about his movement made us recognize this change? Machine Chaplin shows no anticipation, has a rigid spine, and only one or two parts move at the same time. A live Chaplin uses his full body, curves the spine, and reacts to environmental stimuli. We performed improvs and played a game of imaginary dodgeball to experience anticipation. Analyzing animations, we also discovered a repeated sequence in all living characters. They appear to first think, then to have an emotion, and then, and only then, to take action. Thinking, Emotion, action, or what we called a T sequence. Hi, I'm Ayad Andreasen. I'm an instructional assistant professor at Texas A&M in the visualization program at the School of Performance, Visualization and Fine Arts. This year, I introduced photogrammetry to my sophomores in a uh, class called Principles of Design Three. And uh, the students had to incorporate an object that we uh, photographed multiple times, scanned it to the computer, uh, into their interactive environments or games. And I'd love to give you some highlights of their process and the output. As you can see, our students used photogrammetry to great effect in their projects, some of them going above and beyond the initial scope of the assignment. My hope is that they will be using these processes in future projects, um, including digital doubles for archival purposes and digital doubles for film. Thank you so much for your time. Bye-bye. Thank you both for those submissions. Um, I love that they're both fast forward. I have to say that I learned from both of them myself. I, and um, so I'm, I'm looking forward to a great conversation. So I'm going to uh, step aside and hand the reins over to Nindivi Grini. Uh, Giri, how, how, how do I pronounce yeah. your last name? Okay, there we yeah, go. Yeah, just get it. Yeah. Excellent. So mm -hmm. looking forward to this and uh, take it away, Nandini. Sure. Thank you, Nick. Um, so amazing uh, videos. Thank you so much, uh, Mate and Richard. Um, I think now we'll wait for our audience to, you know, you've been seeing these videos, thinking about the T sequence and also photogrammetry. Uh, so please send us your questions through the chat window. And as we start receiving the questions, it'll be great if, uh, you know, we'll start with Mayat. If you can tell us a bit about the motivations for introducing this course to your students, uh, what were the learning objectives, what was the duration of the course, you know, if you could just give us a, a little introduction to the thought process on it. So um, the course that I'm teaching is a sophomore course, and it's an introduction to the three focus areas that we have in visual in the visualization major. So they're um, interactive design, um, uh, animation production, and game development. And so we have to introduce these concepts, all of these concepts, to our students in 15 weeks. So it's in wow. one semester. So we've kind of, those of us who have taught the class have streamlined it down to um, having the students either make an interactive environment, uh, we usually use Unreal, or a game. And um, 
when I was at Seagraph this past summer in LA, uh, I learned that Substance Sampler um, had a photogrammetry tool to it. And I said, oh, well, most of my students have uh, the Adobe Suite and they have access to uh, the Substance Suite. So that is something that we could actually use in class uh, and it, it won't be difficult for them to get the, that application. And so um, I talked to some people who uh, at Adobe and other places, people who do photogrammetry more often so I could get the kind of the pros and cons of it, played with it a lot myself. And I said, I'm gonna introduce this to the students and then they have to put this small thing into their game or interactive environment. And it was a really fun exercise. Got some simple turntables, uh, made sure we had even lighting. Uh, I said students could use their phone. Mm -hmm. um, and I provided um, a bunch of objects, but I told them they could, they could use their own outside of class. Um, most of them used the objects I brought, but uh, one student, she decided she wanted to use it again for her project. You saw that bathroom. So when she was um, on the Thanksgiving break, she went to a plant nursery and she took a ton of pictures there and then integrated those into, into the project. So she kind of took it and ran with it, which was really cool. Thank you so much. So I think students had great fun in this course. And uh, I'll move on to Richard. Uh, if you can tell us about the tea process, like is this something you're doing for the first time or you've done a lot of trial and errors and kind of perfected the methodology? Well, I've done it a lot um, <laughs> in terms of introducing students. The one thing that I've noticed after sort of teaching this for 18 years is that um, students, there are two, two times that students get particularly excited and that is when they get to bring something to life is one of them and the other one is to interact with an environment that they've created um and uh but coming to life i mean literally uh you know students who just have a you know create a blend shape for a mouth to open and they start doing it and they're playing and they're just they're, as soon as they've done it they're so excited so i decided that maybe the thing to focus on was making a making a character whatever that character is um, that they've designed come alive and make that the challenge and dis and define what that means for the students so that they have a focus in terms of that because often when they're first introduced to animation it can be a little bit a lot of, a lot of movement but very lack you know a lot a, a lack of clarity right um and so it helps to sort of focus on you know some problem solving while allowing them to still be creative beyond that. So this was a, you know, a, a, a longer process, which included learning how to texture, learning how to, you know, design the machine and everything like that, which they did. So they all had individual machines. They just had, yes, limitations on that. Um, and I asked them to embrace those limitations. Uh, and so that it would allow them to then focus on the problem solving that was needed to tell their story. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And um, now we have some questions from the audience. Uh, the first one is for Richard. Can you elaborate on what students think of the T methodology? Do you think it can be applied to other fields? Oh, um, I think that the, the, the T methodology uh, does work. Um, I mean, if you look at, you know, I've analyzed a lot of animations and then Charlie Chaplin is really the perfect human uh, embodiment of it because of silent movies and he does it a lot if you see um, in uh, what is it uh, modern times when he goes to prison and he there's a series where he actually just accidentally is snorting coke <laughs> and um, his reactions to that and it just T sequence after T sequence after T sequence and if you analyze animation short shorts I mean what I call a T sequence um, so what it does is, is students often will tend to do, you know, they, they, they will all often find, particularly when they're first doing character animation, they'll think like, well, maybe the character is doing this, maybe the character is doing that, perhaps they're doing this. And I get, you got to get rid of that because they can only have one focus until something makes them change that focus. Um, so you need to make a decision and then go with that decision as much as possible. And the T-sequence helps focus that. The one thing that I have to say is that um, students often at least initially think that they can do the emotion with the action, which is what we can do in 
we do as humans a lot mm -hmm. is we have the emotion and the action at the same time. And it's not that that can't happen in animation. Of course it can. But when you've got a very short animation and you're trying to establish that something that may not be living, like look, be actually, you know, something that we um, imagine is, is alive automatically, the quickest way for us to understand that it is alive is first to make it think. And, and one of the little tricks is to have the ability to blink the eyes. And that's one of the reasons why I do. Yeah, I don't allow them to have that option <laughs> um, and uh, and then have the emotion. And what they often do is that they tie in the emotion with the action or they do a lot of actions in a row. And certainly you can do that at a certain point if you have a longer story or a longer animation. But initially, you really want to separate those three moments is what I've sort of discovered. And it helps focus the student in terms of what they they have to achieve. Thank you. And uh, the other part of the question is, uh, do you think it can be applied to other fields? Well, that's interesting. I, I have yeah. to say I'm not necessarily the expert on this, but I am interested in what it can do, um, mm -hmm. particularly in terms of like robotics, uh, mm -hmm. perhaps uh, um, in terms of creating some sort of empathetic link. Um, because certainly the emotions, uh, the empathy, um, the showing of the emotion is just absolutely vital in terms of our uh, us as humans to uh, interact. Um, so I think it definitely has that option. And I've, I've been working on a few grant applications which have to do with uh, sort of VR training modules and where humans would have to have emotions and so it's talking about that the other thing that i think it could be interesting in terms uh, is sort of the dealing with digital like realistic digital humans and making sure that uh or exploring movement as uh in a way of solving sort of the problems that are caused by the uncanny valley mm -hmm. um so those are the three things that i can think of think yeah, yeah. Cool. And uh, the next question is kind of tied to what you've already been explaining. Uh, it seems your approach borrows from other fields like theater and film. You also mentioned like robotics and the uncanny valley now. So uh, can you speak more about that? So if there's something on the theatrical and film side that you'd like to bring in? Well, um, that sort of brings back, brings over my past. And that is that I, I was a professional actor for 17 years. So and and particularly in theater. So absolutely, and I bring that into play in terms of my teaching, but also in terms of the sort of the performances uh, and the staging in particular of the uh, of the um, T sequence. So, um, you know, it's one of the reasons, that, you know, one of the things, one of the limitations that students certainly uh, complain, <laughs> sort of complain about initially is that they can't, I'm not, I don't allow them to move the camera. Um, and what what's great about that limitation, if I may say, is that they now have to really troubleshoot the staging so that there's a clarity of story so that the entire events of their story is is understandable. And having not being able to move the camera, first of all, stops all that sort of crazy movement that can happen in a 12 second animation or 15 second animation that's not necessary. And then the other thing is it also allows you to teach them about the importance of silhouette so that students don't have action happening in front of other action and everything and that they're showing, you know, the character is showing something in, in silhouette or in profile. Um, and so you're able to teach a lot of elements of, in terms of animation and storytelling and staging and certainly, you know, the past in terms of staging, in terms of like understanding, you know, if you have something breaking the frame that it leads, uh, alludes to a world outside of that frame and things like that. So, it, yeah, so, so definitely the, my, my theatrical background certainly comes into play. Cool. Um, so then the next question is, how do students initially respond to the constraints you placed on their courses and assignments? Right. Yeah. Uh, so I've sort of addressed that a little bit, yes. but they certainly um, they certainly uh, do, um, you know, they initially want to be able to create their own thing, do their own thing and, and, and everything. And not all of them. And I have to say, so there's a couple of stories. I used to teach at a, a community college and and uh, I thought that, you know, if it were me, 
um, there was a, you know, when they went into their portfolio class, if I was in that portfolio class, I'd be like, oh, allow me to do my own creation. And so I actually worked towards a situation where I, I gave students several projects in the portfolio class to do new works, like their own choosing. And the feedback I got were that, I mean, apart that it would work for like one or two of the students who were particularly self-motivated and everything. But most of the students actually came to me at the end and said, we prefer when there's a little bit more guidance and structure. Mm -hmm. um, and I think particularly, I think many of us have probably experienced sort of those students coming out of the pandemic that that there's an element of, you know, I think that they embrace that once you 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 encourage them to embrace it, you know, it, it sounds like a negative, the limitations, but you try and show them how it can they help them to focus their attention on and 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 accomplish and complete the project as opposed to being unsatisfied with their final result. Um, it can it can help, but it, it, it no, I mean, I won't I won't deny it that it does take some convincing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. And uh, now we move on to Mayet. Um, one of the questions from the audience is, what were some of the ways your students went above and beyond with their work? Um, well, uh, I mentioned kind of a little bit before. So there were several ways, but the one that was really impressive was the student who took her personal time during <laughs> during break and uh, went out and took images because she wanted to incorporate that into her group project. I thought that was really great. That was not required. She, Her group had already met that requirement of scanning an object in and putting it in scene. Um, some of the other things that the students had to do, so it, it was just required that they scanned it, they optimized it for a real-time engine, um, and they put it into their interactive environment or game. They did not need to change the textures in any way, shape or form, but a lot of the students did that. They went in and they experimented with changing the textures to match more their style, um, especially if they had a, um, a very stylized style that wasn't hyper-realistic. And they really tried to make those objects their own and really fit within the scene as opposed to just being placed in the scene. Mm -hmm. Cool. Okay. So in a way, you know, like this session's title is principles and concepts. And so it's about like you mentioning photogrammetry and then this whole uh, sequence method of animating. Um, so what is what are some guidelines or advice for instructors and educators to be able to take these concepts and integrate into their own curriculum, into existing content? Um, well, I think one of the great things about uh, the more I learn about photogrammetry is there's a lot of different applications that you can use. You don't have to just use Substance Sampler. There's there's Luma. There's um, Unreal has a, a, a phone app as well as a, um, I think it's called Reality Scan, as well as a um, uh, computer application. So, and, and a lot of these are free for people to use. So students can download these all as on their phone and use them. Um, and I've been playing around with some of the different um, applications other than just sampler. So that's number one. So I feel like in terms of the technology, it's more accessible. So really it's choose the one that works best for you in your class. Uh, two, I it's not super expensive to buy a turntable. You know, if it's not a, an electric turntable, most turntables are about nine, nine to twelve dollars. So you can get a turntable uh, that students can use for small objects. Um, three, you can use small objects, so things that are easily carried. Like students don't have to use very large objects. You know, that's a whole different kind of class when you're scanning whole environments. And um, as long as you have a place that has pretty even lighting, right, um, then you and you you have access to these applications, I think you can implement this into your class as an assignment so that students understand kind of the process and how it works. Yeah, I think that's very helpful, like kind of adding it as an extra layer to our pipeline and kind of showing off in portfolios. Yeah. Um, and we have a couple of uh, follow up questions for Mayet. Uh, any requirements for optimization so that interaction did not lag or were the scenes never complicate complex enough to cause problems? 
Yeah, everything had to be optimized. So when you scan it in, uh, it's they're really high poly models. They're pretty messy. So um, one good thing is there's several programs that auto retop for you. I mean, you could do old school retopping uh, in ZBrush or, you know, there's Quadra and Maya, there's all that stuff. But Maya 2024 has an auto retop tool. <laughs> so my students are using that. And even if there's like one funky area, then you can go in with and like do the old school cleaning up of it. So that's that speed sped up that process. Um, obviously the textures are already there. You just have to bake the um, the high poly to the low poly to, to transfer those UVs. And then uh, it's kind of ready to go once you export the low poly um, as an FBX to, to take into whatever new program you wanna take it into whatever real-time engine. So it is required to optimize, you know, mm -hmm. you don't want to muffin just like a million polys. <laughs> That's not the main part of your scene. <laughs> yeah, I know, That's Professor. A big <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's a professor here using ladybugs for photogrammetry. So <laughs> yeah, uh, but again, I think there was one more question. Yes. Did you have any scenarios for your students to work together and collaborate to capture and assemble more complicated subjects such as large locations or complicated machinery? No, this was the first time I've instituted this in that particular class. Now it is a group based class, um, you know, obviously making an interactive environment or game in 15 weeks is a tall order. And so they were all in groups and so they had to collaborate in order to do that um we didn't do we didn't take images of larger objects uh at the time that might be something i would like to introduce to them in the future mm -hmm. And uh, were there any surprising challenges your students ran into? Yes. So uh, for those who have done photogrammetry, there's all sorts of fun challenges. <laughs> um, you absolutely have to have even lighting. Um, highly reflective objects do not work. So if it's metallic or glass, forget about it. Um, I would uh, recommend if you absolutely want metal that you get like a matte spray to dull the metal, basically. Um, also, if you see other people in the image, that's a problem. I found a bug in Sampler that nobody was able to figure out at Adobe, and I finally was able to figure it out. <laughs> and that is if you accidentally cut off an image that you're taking the picture of, the mask will not properly be created, and it will um, crash the entire program when you're trying to do the data you know, compil compiling all that data to make the 3D object. So I I found in the error the offending image and took it out and then everything worked just fine. So you cannot cut off the object in any way, shape or form. <laughs> um, and uh, you don't want, you want it to be a pretty um, clean area around the object and very neutral and have contrast. So if you have an object that's brown, um, having a tan or brown area around it is not going to work very well. <laughs> but if you have um, a brown object and it's on a white floor, then that'll be fine, right? So contrast in terms of the object and what it's placed on. Right, thank you so much. And now moving back to Richard, uh, we have a question from the audience. Were there any particular concepts that were more challenging than others for students to grok when bringing a non-living character to life? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that, you know, without repeating myself, uh, the, the certainly the separate, the em getting the emotion in there, making sure that the emotion stands on its own in mm -hmm. between the thinking and the action, um, that definitely is something that sort of needs to be focused on. The other thing that I would say, and, and this is something that I learned because when I was creating my own version of this, um, I got so bored doing the machine part <laughs> that I was just like, I'm gonna just, I'm gonna add in this little bit of anticipation. Um, and as soon as I did that, the machine took on an attitude. It was mm -hmm. fascinating. And so I had to cut it out and then I and then I brought in the anticipation. So the other thing about I, I would say the teaching anticipation is sometimes a little bit tough that students realize that 
every time that the the live thing right the live thing um act, you know does a motion of any kind it needs to do anticipation in the opposite direction first no matter what um, the only time it doesn't is if it's, you know, it's hit by surprise by something or, you know, it, 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 something happens to it by surprise that it didn't, you know, obviously it couldn't anticipate. So that would be the other thing. The, the, the last thing that I think I learned from teaching this particular version of the project was that the, the machine design, um, it, for, so for the machine to like, to be able to have a quote unquote spine, when the machine comes alive, if you don't have a head and you don't have legs, right? To have a spine, it needed to have the, the, the quote unquote body of the machine needed to be able to separate somewhat so you could create the curvature. So, so quite a few students had like, you know, had a big mechanical arm or with a, or something with a very long rigid body that couldn't separate when you got to animate the character part of it and make it come alive. So when you couldn't do that exaggeration and have it come apart and have it separate, it was very hard for the student to create any kind of curvature in terms of the spine. So so it it's now this curriculum is moving to another. It's it's being taught in a in a, in a class that I'm not teaching, and uh, one of the things I told the the faculty who are teaching it now is try and encourage the students when they're designing their machine because they haven't yet animated it to design something that can create a, that they can create a quote unquote spine from. Mm. Okay, thank you. And, uh, you know, now that you've kind of tested this method, uh, what I what's your next plan? Uh, this is, is for Richard, oh, okay. you know, talking um, about the sequence and expanding on this idea. Um. Well, they'd actually the students in the same class went on to do another uh, project, which I, I which is uh, I call uh, the Artful Dodger, where they have a character that has no arms but has a spy now, and it's when they learn how skinning and everything. So there's a lot of other elements to the project, but ultimately, this character has you know something thrown at it, and it has to see the thing about to be thrown. Um, have an emotion about that and then act either to yeah. or away, jump away or something like that. So it gives them again, again, some structure and limitations if we want to put it that way, but, but um, ultimately it allows them to bring a, again, a sort of more complex character to life. Um, and uh, so again, still using that sequence. I am uh, on an aside, I'm very interested in in pursuing. I mean, it's not like it's anything particularly new because Disney used Charlie Chaplin and everything. Mm -hmm. But um, I've analyzed a lot of his film work and his the acting, and it's it's kind of exciting to really be able to dissect why something works in in, in terms of and how that relates to animation. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, and now we have another question from the audience for Richard. Uh, it's more a comment. Your approach reminded me of Brenda Laurel's pioneering work placeholder, in which she worked with a theater group to create a VR piece which mimicked animals' behavior and attitudes. This is back in the 90s. So you could put a VR set and become a crow, a snake, a fish, or a bird. So this is from Regine Spitz. I hope I yeah, mentioned yeah. it. I remember an exercise when uh -huh. years ago, decades ago, when I was an actor, where we had to come in and pretend to be a mm -hmm. an animal and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. The other thing I was just re remembering is um, one of the reason of the use of the theatrical neutral masks is again not allowing students, you know, especially as adults, we become much less physically, at, you know, open in terms of our bodies, and so it's an idea of you. Okay, you can't express yourself with any facial expressions forget the facial expressions focus on what your body can your body tell us the story um mm -hmm. so that's kind of behind that so it's similar to sort of having an animal that can't speak or whatever or doesn't necessarily have facial expressions i mean to to an extent that that humans do and then and then sort of having it again to focus on what is the body 
language in terms of telling us the story. And how do you see technology kind of being an intervention, um, kind of like the embodiment aspect of acting and bringing out emotions? Okay, so um, that's a great question. And that's actually a little bit, nice. so um, maybe a, arguably a more traditional way of teaching animation or, or at least the first character animation is a walk cycle or a run cycle or making a character jump or something like that. Again, the whole the whole focus is on movement, right? As opposed to the character being alive necessarily. Um, and I think that, you know, so much of that now can be done with motion capture. Um, and maybe, you know, technology is going to only going to get better that way. Um, so the, the, so again, that's another reason why I focus on, okay, where, where, what is the thing that's hard to replicate with, um, with motion capture and that is anticipation, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it, and, and so that's why, again, Charlie Chaplin becomes a great example of, you know, in terms of dissecting his movement. Um, the other thing is to focus on stylized uh characters and stylized animation where you're not doing something that's necessary the movement isn't realistic so you have to have exaggeration you have to have anticipation these are all you know things of the 12 principles that you don't necessarily or don't, don't natively capture in something that's you know, with motion capture mm -hmm. yeah yeah i think it's an interesting uh, future for exploration and um, so thank you and again we move back to may it uh, we have a question from nick was there any particular aspect of learning photogrammetry that seemed to result in a change in how students thought about their work or thinking, uh, ch change in perspective on the world around them? Um, I, I feel like it did. I, I, I think it opened up new avenues of problem solving in terms of integrating new techniques into a project. So, Whereas before, it's just like, okay, you you look at your reference, you build your model, you lay out UVs, you texture, you integrate. But in this case, it's like, okay, maybe there's some objects that aren't hero objects that are just background objects. And maybe we can speed up our workflow by using this technique to get the objects that we need to put in the background. So I felt like it, it, it kind of made it okay for students to use techniques that that allow the workflow to be sped up um, and to start thinking a little bit more outside of the box in terms of, oh, how can we use some of these newer technologies to get things done faster and still have a really good finished product? Mm -hmm. Okay, so then there's a follow-up question. Uh, from Richard, if this was the first time teaching this, what were the lessons learned? What would you do differently? And I think these are coming back to you, Richard, as well, like the same questions, but yeah. Um, well, I think uh, one of the, well, I learned a lot about what you can and can't scan effectively into the computer. I'll tell you that. Um, cloth works very well if it's very if, it, if it's not big fibers um, I was really surprised I, I brought a very old um, stuffed animal uh, that my parents got for me um, from I think it was from Thailand uh, and it scanned so well it was beautiful pastries scan really well mm -hmm. um, wood objects so those I, I had to learn, I had to experiment a lot to find out what was going to work so that my students didn't just get stuck and frustrated. So because it was the first time with me doing it, for me, I learn um, uh, kinetically and visually. That's how I learn. So I had to do all of that first and it was, it was tough. <laughs> and um, once I figured out what worked, I was able to bring that to my students and I I told them too. I said, these are the things that I found works. 
These are the things that I find don't work. This is what you have to do. And they still kind of had to learn the hard way because they would still get other people in the pictures. And it was like, it's not scanning properly. I was like, well, you have two people in the background. So that's probably why. Um, so I think differently, um, what I would do is I would set up very defined stations before it was a little bit more haphazard. So there'd be very defined stations. Um, I would make sure that groups knew, like, when you take those pictures, somebody can turn the turntable, but you can't have anybody around. Like, everybody should be back, so that'll make it easier for people. Um, we had even lighting, so that worked. And I'd probably also tell them to bring in some objects themselves, so I would not provide all the objects myself. Mm -hmm. Great. And now back to Richard. Uh, you know, we go back to the previous question, thinking about uh, how did the results of your class, the T process, kind of change in how students think about their own work? And uh, yeah, the um, other one. Sorry, go on. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think we'll go like one at a time. So okay, um, uh, I think that I mean, what, what was. I mean, this is sort of anecdotally. Um, so I, you know, it, I I know that the students, the students responded ultimately when they saw their creation come alive, which is what I was hoping is that they became much more invested in it, right? Mm -hmm. And so um, the, you know, I had a student who said that they had shown their machine animation to their parents and. You know, they were like, well, you know, the parents said, oh, it's like Pixar, you know, that kind of thing. So they were very, so that was kind of good that they were getting that response from, you know, from their parents in terms of that. And then the, the other thing was I had students who hadn't thought of, anim you know, animation as a sort of purpose, <sighs> who suddenly got, you know, expressed interest in that being maybe their focus. Um, so that is, you know, but again, that's just, you know, that's not data driven. That's just anecdotal, you know, people, students responding to stuff, um, in that respect. So, uh, that was, uh, that was good. I mean, I, th I think that the, the, the challenge always is making sure that you're challenging, you know, the students at the, uh, at the, at the higher end, uh, motivationally or, you mm -hmm. know, who are quicker at it, mm -hmm. uh, and you're that you're still bringing along the students at the at the at the other end of the spectrum who may be struggling a little bit harder, but that they end up with something that they that is good for their portfolio, right? So that that's uh -huh. definitely the biggest challenge. Mm -hmm. And uh, I resonate with this challenge because anytime I want to experiment with a new concept, I always see mixed reactions where. Uh, some students really enjoy the challenge, but are those who need a little more material to first understand and then implement. Uh, so any tips on how do you handle this classroom with students having different backgrounds and different skill levels? Yeah. Um, and so that was, and I, I would argue that was particularly a challenge this semester because students had had sort of very different sort of instructional uh, backgrounds uh, mm -hmm. that, that I had gotten. So some of them had literally not even touched 3D at all. Um, so that was, so it was a very, so that's why, again, I, I haven't gone into this, but the, the structure, it's kind of, you know, I break it down into three assignments because some of the students really had to learn even to model in 3D to start out with, right? So I, I sort of gave some I really broke it down in terms of that. Now, um, uh, I think that the, um, yeah, I mean, it, that that's the, cha the, the challenge of that, 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 that spectrum challenge in terms of bringing everyone along is, is definitely the most complex um, in terms of that. But the, the, the detail in terms of also uh, students having different, they also have different passions, right? So you have to convince them that they, you know, that if they're a 2D animator, that yeah, the 3D, you're going to learn the same stuff. You know, it's it's, it's a, largely the same principles, and you can be good at that too. You know, or mm -hmm. and and it's good to ha be able to do both, right? Mm -hmm. so, so it's 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 a little bit. I would say that probably the biggest convincing I had to do was when they had to do the improv work, uh -huh. because students who want to sit behind a computer 14 hours a day are not the yeah. ones who generally want to get up on stage. Mm -hmm. So I, I generally would try to break the ice by doing it myself. 
I'm making a fool of myself as much as possible so that they would feel comfortable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, mate, uh, what are your thoughts? And there's another question just, you know, on the same lines. Uh, how do you up the challenge for students that pick up the concepts quickly? So. Oh, okay. Well, <laughs> um, you know, because the students were in their second year, um, I feel like most of them were kind of on the even even keel like they're the prerequisites they have to get into the class and so they were pretty even in terms of their knowledge base but i would probably uh if a student said i'm getting this really quickly um and i want to do more of this i would say okay why don't you do one or two more maybe i'd give them extra credit for it and then i'd challenge them to integrate it and see if i can't figure out what the object is right? It's just integrated so well that I just think it's a model somebody did. And that's what I would do for the challenge. It's like, I want you to, to fool me. So I have to look and try and figure out what this object is. <laughs> cool. Okay, then. Um, so we still have another 10 minutes. Uh, let me just look. Um, but in the meantime, uh, a question for the audience. You know, is there any final questions or comments that you want to leave for our presenters in this session today? We'll just uh, take a minute for the audience to type. And if there's anything you'd like to share with our audience, Nomate and Richard. I think that's it. So I'll thank you so much, uh, Mate and Richard. Uh, we had a very engaging session. Um, I can imagine the fun students are having taking your courses. So I would love to enroll sometime. So I'll thank you very much and I'll hand it over to Nick. Oh, thank you, thank you so much. All, all three of you, uh, Richard, Mayet, Nandini, mm -hmm. I, it's, it's been an, a pure pleasure listening to all of the conversation and and extra insights and, and all of that. I think I love how both of these courses are they're completely different from one another, but both of them can be scaled to introduce brand new concepts to entire newcomers to computer graphics in general. But then also I love the way that you can challenge folks that might be more experienced, but now up oh, you know, I got to push you out of your comfort zone. Too bad. Don't get used to this. Just, you know, there's got to be, there's going to be ways for us to make it harder for you. Um, so thank you all. I think, uh, yeah, I mean, we're at 12 minutes after the hour now. Our next session doesn't start until 30 minutes after the hour. So we have a nice little break here. And so thank you all. We'll go ahead and stop the recording for this session.